generation's most creative and successful artist. His artwork is inspired by animals in a way that animals move in nature. Influenced to think creatively from a young age by his uncle, noted photographer Peter Beard, and his mother, author, and editor, Patricia Beard, Alex grew up in New York City of the 1970s among some of the world's most interesting and influential people. Andy Warhol, Truman Capote, and their pop world cohorts were familiar faces in the Beard household. He studied art at the School of Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and the New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts and participated in the New York Studio School's Drawing Marathon. His first solo exhibition was in Soho during his early 20s. Since then, he has had significant one-man shows in New York, Los Angeles, New Orleans, and cities as far afield as Hong Kong. He is the creator of a unique style of painting called Extra Abstract Naturalism and is considered by many a successor to the school of visual mathematicians championed by M. C. Escher. Alex's artwork hangs in public and private collections around the world. His critically acclaimed best-selling Tales from the Watering Hole collection of illustrated children's books and his series of puzzles for adults have become the inspiration for a unique body of products created to extend the dialogue between artists and consumer. In addition to his books and puzzles, Alex's original artwork has been transformed into an impressive line of successful products at the national retail level, including journals, sketchbooks, art and activity kits, and games for both children's and adult markets. The Watering Hole Foundation is a charity created by Alex in 2012 to help sa save endangered wildlife and the environments in which they live. Stemming from this char charitable cause that Alex feels very strongly about, he is now dipping his toes into the world of film. His new documentary film, Drawing the Line, chronicles the plight of the endangered wild African elephant as seen through the eyes of a conservationist artist. The film will premiere in New York City in September 2000. Well, it did, it did premiere it did. in 2014 in New York City. <laughs> Alex is also an adventurer. His extensive travels and his desire to visit the world's most untouched and often remote wildernesses have brought him on extended journeys through Africa, India, Australia, the Americas, and Asia. His New Orleans studio has become at the hub of an art career that has blossomed into more than just a creative endeavor. It's also a successful enterprise. A firm believer that art is a medium that should be accessible to everyone, Alex uses uncommon avenues to share the creative experience with people of all ages. New Orleans is Alex's adopted home. He and his wife and two children live in a garden district. His painting studio and gallery, the Alex Beard Studio, is on Gallery Row. I changed. I did. I did. Located at 608 Julia Street in the downtown development district. How about a round of applause for our first guest, Alex Beard? Um, Can I say, by the way, that when read like that, it's much more impressive than it actually is. <laughs> uh, let's start off with how you got into painting. Okay. How did that happen? I, um, I'm just old enough, you and I probably both, are just old enough to have had to learn things traditionally before the technological explosion occurred. It happened while I was in college, amazingly enough, right? When I was at boarding school, if you wanted to write a paper, you could backspace three spaces to erase. That was it. By the time I got out of college, everybody had a laptop and a cell phone. So that's an amazing shift. But what that means is that there was an expectation for how you would live your life that was different for me as a child than for somebody who's considerably younger now, a millennial, as they would view their future. So for me, if I wanted to be artistic, not just a painter, but artistic, I could write for magazines, which still existed and paid people then. I could make original artwork to be shown in galleries. I could make illustrations for stories, and I could do stuff that ended up getting animated. Um, and then I could do all sort of the traditional means of how do you think about uh, writing and painting and photography and photojournalism and all that stuff all mixed together. So there was not a single clear path. It was that creativity was an avenue down which you could walk. And so I did a little bit of all of it. I like to travel. One of the things you heard about in that bio is that I like to travel. And I don't have a trillion dollars, so how do you do that? 
And for me, it started when I was at boarding school and then in college where I would figure out how to get credit for the travels that I went on so that my parents would pay for them. And they weren't fancy. It was like, hey, just buy me airplane tickets and I'll get a full semester's worth of credit through the university or the school that I'm enrolled in. And it's the same if you're paying tuition anyway, right? So off we go. And then when it got to be time to get a job, it was, okay, now who's going to pay for the trip? And I would come up with an idea. And, and the first one that I did where this worked was I was a month out of college, and I said that in 1900, there were 100,000 Bengal tigers in India. And in 1993, the year that I graduated from college, there were 3,000 left in the world, both in captivity and in the wild. So in 1900, a kid from New York City could get on a boat and go to Bombay and within a week be on the back of an elephant and see and shoot a tiger in the wild. No harm, no foul, no difficulty. Was it even possible to see a tiger in the wild at all as that same kid less than a century later? And I then went to Esquire and Men's Journal and a couple of other places and I said, I'm going and um, you should pay me. And if it doesn't if I turn out to be terrible, do you know it's no skin off your nose? But maybe I won't be, and maybe I'll be really good. And the worst thing you got to do is just give me some press credentials and a kill fee, which is a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks, just to pay for me to travel around as a twenty-something-year-old in Indian. So off I went, and I found out that it was much more difficult to find a tiger in the wild than one might suspect. Even though, <laughs> even with three thousand of them, there were basically almost none. It took me months and months and months to do. And in the course of it, I was supposed to be taking photographs to illustrate the story that I was writing for Men's Journal. And somebody stole all my cameras on a train. And my camera bag that had all my film in it. And now I was just out of luck. I was on a train from, I think, Calcutta to, no, it couldn't have been. I was on a, a two-day train, at any rate. And they stole my stuff, leaving the station from where I was embarking out of. So then I had two days to think about it on a train. How nice is that? Um, interestingly enough, and you know, I'm tangential. You don't mind that, right? Not at all. Okay. So interestingly enough, a guy died in my compartment during that trip at like 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of fuck all. I mean, nowhere. Rice paddies for 500 miles that way and that way. Wait, what do you mean he died in your compartment? I mean, he died. No mas life died. <laughs> Gathered to the great majority, and okay, wait. So, <laughs> so now it's about two o'clock in the morning, and this guy's wife. And we'd all been having tea and chatting and whatever, and he was portly and I guess old, and his time had come. Happens to us all, sooner or later. In this case, in this guy's case, sooner. And it was like two o'clock in the morning. His wife jumps up. She starts running down back and forth. Were you sitting the, next to him? No, I was across the way. Probably from me to him. And <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. I don't yeah, bring that. I don't bring that mojo. The last person said before, wait for him to die. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the the amazing thing about it is that everybody in the car, life and death, is so interchangeable in an overpopulated place like that, and it's so frequent that everybody in the car that knew him and didn't know him and like that, they all got up and in a long line, they all came by our little compartment, and they all squeezed his toe. He was, bank, he was barefoot, and he was sort of now lying out on this thing. And they all came and they squeezed this guy's toe. And then, with all of their bags and everything else, they took the guy, the now dead guy, and his very distraught wife and all their bags and left them at a platform in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Off we go. Now, irrespective of that. So this is all, right? I mean, life is interesting when you go out and you start poking around. And so... Um, so now there I'm on this train. I don't have any cameras. I'm four months into this trip. This guy's just died. They left him on the side of the tracks in a rice paddy. And I'm really screwed. And I ended up in Calcutta um, not that much lo there longer after. And there was a strike, right, in Bengal. They had this Bengali strike. I don't even know what they were striking about. Tell us but just a little bit about Calcutta. It is. Calcutta is um, very much like New Orleans, actually. If I didn't live in New Orleans and I was slightly braver, I might live in Calcutta. It's another city that's at the mouth of a major river. Right? New Orleans, Calcutta, Kinshasa have more in similarity to each other than you know, New Orleans and pick a place that's nowhere near water, Kansas City. I mean, there, there, there's a certain ethos which is 
which transcends nation, transcends um, language, transcends religion, that has to do with being at the point where the water from great land masses meets the water of the world. It has to do with commerce. It has to do with the flow of impermanence. It has to do with all kinds of things, which are a separate conversation from today. Um, so at any rate, I go down to see this Bengali demonstration, which is like tens of thousands of people walking through the streets chanting things in Bengali that I didn't understand. And out of it, I was sort of swept into an art supply store that was like this Victorian place that nobody had been in for quite a while. I mean, certainly not too many patrons. And in India at that time, there were no computers, right? So it's all paper stacked from floor to ceiling. You know, you go through a, a, a hallway that would be 10 feet wide that's actually only three feet wide because it's all paper stacked from floor to ceiling. And into this place I go, and it was unmistakable the moment that I walked in. The smell, the vials of pigment, the canvases, the brushes, all that stuff, that this is what I wanted to do. And so I uh, bought a bunch of art supplies, and I went and sat in a, I mean, I suppose for lack of a better term, I sat in a hut on the beach in southern India and ate seafood and painted for the next six weeks. And, and in the course of that, found the tiger and did all that, but I ended up making it so that the illustrations for the story that I wrote and other stories that I subsequently wrote were made by hand as opposed to made by film. And although, the, you know, magazine editors want to make sure if you're going to go look for a tiger that there's a picture of a tiger, so that's there too, but it was much more illustrative. And it became clear to me that people were more interested in what I was illustrating perhaps than what I was writing. The writing was a little didactic. So... Um, so far. So, and then I figured that I could sponsor my next trip by selling the art from the last trip. So then I do an exhibition. And in that case, I did it in New York, right? So then I had a show and sell $20,000 worth of work and you pump it right back into going to the next place. That's a very, very long tangential answer to the <laughs> where did I start painting question, but that's the truth. How many people in here you think know what a Nautilus is? Oh, all of them, whether they know that that's what it's called or not. But I'll bet that this, this is a savvy-looking crew. I need you to give me a number. How many people are in here? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17. Uh, 13 of them know what a Nautilus is. Okay, let's see. How many of you all know what a Nautilus is? Come What's on. A Nautilus, a Nautilus. How many of you know what a well, Nautilus, Nautilus is? Nautilus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, so raise your hands. N a u t i l u s Nautilus. Like a shell. The shell. Mm -hmm. Naturalist. So that's. And an animal lives in that shell. It's a submarine, twenty thousand leagues under the sea. Also, also. Um, you want me to start scribbling on the board, Dave? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is that the idea of what that is? <laughs> that's your cue. We've met before. <laughs> okay, so visual mathematics. And the math of the math and science of life. So, um, mathematics, math. I was terrible at math in school because it's taught, or at least it was taught to me, as a quantitative device. Two plus two equals four. How do you do your taxes? Not interesting enough. I mean, there's unless you're really wired for it, which I'm not that way. It's difficult. Uh, and so therefore, not what you really want to pay too much attention to. Um, until you can start putting it into the context of life. So then why is math important other than how do you do your taxes? And it's because it can also be taught as a qualitative device, as something which is trying to get at the spiritual unity of all things in the universe, in a way, in a language which is using numbers, as opposed to a Bible or a Quran or something else, right? But they're all talking about the same thing, and it has to do with... The, with the underlying stuff that holds everything together. So in the case of the Nautilus, and the Nautilus is that. That doesn't work. OK. All right, so that's the Nautilus. So uh, somebody said seashell. The Jules Verne. How about the universe? It's also that shape and quite a lot of things in the middle. Here in New Orleans, we're familiar with this because it's the shape of a hurricane and its winds. 
So what you start to find is that the smallest thing that we could see under a high-powered microscope, smallest living thing, is an itty-bitty little paramecium that has that shape. And the very, very largest thing that we could see, and we can't even see it from here, we've got to send the Hubble telescope out beyond us to look back, is a huge universe that incorporates all the things that we've ever been able to see in the history of humanity, and it's all in that same shape. Now then, interestingly enough, and this is where it starts to get into the realm of being a painter and a visual mathematician, we see, or we have at least come to see, in terms of rectangles. And the most obvious example of that is that there are a couple of television screens that are both broadcasting what, we're, so what I'm saying right now and also recording it, both of which are rectangles through a window, which is a rectangle, to a television screen, which is a rectangle, to a door that we walk through, which is a rectangle, to a set of boards, which are rectangular. So that's not the strongest building device. If you really want to build strong stuff, you do it out of pyramids, not necessarily out of rectangles. But our architecture is all based out of rectangles. So you start to ask yourself, if you're interested in this stuff, why? Right? I mean, what's the, what's the thing about the rectangle? So, I view it that there are, that you can view the addition of dimension to the one dimensional surface as the seminal moments throughout the course of the last 40,000 years of human thought where we perceive ourselves in relationship to our surroundings in an enlightened manner. That's a hell of a wordy <laughs> thing to say, but nonetheless it doesn't make it any less pertinent than this. And what I mean by that is if you're in a cave in Lascaux and you're making a cave painting, what you are making is one dimensional. It has no border other than the flat surface of the cave. As soon as you intentionally put whatever you're making into a frame, into a rectangle, it becomes two dimensional, right? And now it has a top and a bottom. And everything about what you've just done has changed. You're no longer just a hunter-gatherer. You are now living in a village around which there are walls. You are no longer just dealing in the one immediate, what am I going to eat and what is its relationship to me and its spirituality, to something where you can make it and take it off of your easel, wall, what, floor, whatever, and hand it to somebody else and it transfers information in a whole different way. Now, so that's one dimension, two dimensions, and it happens at the same time that we stop being cavemen, we start living in villages, and then you draw a line through the middle of it, and you put a triangle on the bottom, and right, you have depth. And so now you've taken what was previously one dimensional, and you've now added a third dimension to it, which is the dimension of depth. And it's occurred, occurring at exactly the same time that we have a surplus for the first time. And now we're not just behind our walls trying to keep ourselves alive. We are now behind our walls looking beyond them to the horizon for trade, for exploration, for all kinds of things. And we fiddle with this stuff, by the way, for thousands of years, right? I mean, it's not that you go from one point to two point to three point overnight. It takes you multiple generations to get there. And they happen in little incremental moments. So depth is one-point perspective, but it's also two-point perspective, right? And it's also chiaroscuro, which is the use of light and dark. So you're turning a plug where you put something really light next to something really dark, and the light thing comes forward, the dark thing goes back. So it's all these different tricks for how you're thinking about how to create depth while we're continuing as a civilization, as a series of civilizations, in fact, to think about how do we address ourselves in relationship to our surroundings and our expanding horizons. Up until just now, really, and we're probably still doing it in ways by going into space, etc. Now, then, a fourth dimension people think of is time. So um, Picasso and Brock are talking about cubism at the same time that Einstein is talking about time's relativity, is the same time that Jazz is talking about how you do structures that are looping back on, back, back on themselves. So what you end up with is it's sort of the zeitgeist bubbles this stuff up, right? Um, and things have accelerated over the course of the last hundred years, so you can have quite a lot of advancement much, much more quickly because you have that much more 
communication amongst people it doesn't mean that we understand it any better, but it does tend to permeate through, um, through the masses more quickly. So now back to the Nautilus, this same rectangle that is that hugely important step in how do we perceive ourselves in relationship to our surroundings by thinking dimensionally in terms of how many dimensions can we perceive, the Greeks took this rectangle and they split it into even proportionate thirds. So that this rectangle, this rectangle, and this rectangle share the same proportions as the original. And then they split it again and you end up with nine rectangles proportionate to the original rectangle, and that's the Parthenon. So all of the ancient world is built off of how do you break up the rectangle into these points of intersection which create structure and tension, and also allow us to see how do we perceive ourselves in relationship to our surroundings. Not just obviously as in looking through a window, but also as in this is the plane on which we have decided to work. This is the platform on which we've decided to use as our means of communication. So then, a little while goes by, and an Italian mathematician in the 12th and 13th century named Fibonacci, who's famous for a number sequence. Fibonacci, you guys might know, if you know him, has 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, ad infinitum. That's an exponential growth system. It sort of defines the way generations of rabbits most specifically proliferate. But it also has to do with how roots grow and how things, so it has to do with the exponential growth system. And it's zero and one is one, and one and one is two, and one and two is three, and two and three is five, and three and five is eight, and five and eight is 13, etc. You can go infinitely high with that. And there are people that play the commodities markets based off of this over 100 years. They know that it's going to grow according to a certain exponential system, which is all based off of this very, very simple number sequence that was devised by this guy, Fibonacci. So Fibonacci also, less famously, but no less importantly in the context for me, more importantly, <coughs> said if you take the original rectangle, which you create is a rectangle with a proportionate rectangle inside of it and a square. And this rectangle, is to this square as, this is a little wrong, but this rectangle is to this square, and this rectangle is to this square, and this rectangle is to this square, and this rectangle is to this square, going infinitely small. And when the points connect, it creates a nullus. Now, this is where this stuff starts to get pretty groovy. So, as a classical painter, it was figured out that your eye is drawn to the diminishing point of the Nautilus in the rectangle. So, here, you put your most dramatic moment where the viewer is most likely going to go. So St. George and the dragon, the dragon's head and the spear converge on that spot and you stand in front of it and you close your eyes and you open them and a million times out of a million you start in the same place. And it's, it's one of these universal things, right? We're all drawn to this diminishing point in the design of the rectangle based off of where the Nautilus finds its diminishing point. Now, the part that's so groovy to me is that if you divide that distance into that distance, you get, depending on whether you're dividing this into this or this into this, 0 0.1618. And that is the divine proportion. And if you divide this into this, it's that. And this into this, and this into this, and all the way through your body. So now, and if you think about Michelangelo's drawing of this, of the human, with all of his variations of the heads going through the middle, and the arms and the legs extended to be creating a perfect circle all the way around, regardless of where the arms and the legs go, you all know the drawing that I'm talking about? That's all about this. It's all about the divine proportion, showing you how the divine proportion works in a human body. So now, what that then says to me is that there's some kind of spiritual connection that has to do with why is the spiral 
in the seashell and the paramecium and the universe the same as where my eye is drawn when I apply the divine proportion to the rectangle, which is the platform that we have chosen to use as our means of creativity and communication. So, is that what you were looking for, some version of that, Basically. about what's the Nautilus doing? So now then, what that then says to me is that if those things are all related to each other, and all the things in between, right? We talked about the hurricane winds and the tub flush the toilet, and that's the direction that it goes. Or if you look straight down on a rose, that all of the leaves grow in a spiral going like this, so that no two of them are stacked on top of each other, so the rainwater that hits this one doesn't miss this one because it catches it all the way around. I mean, this is playing itself out through all the manifestations of nature that we can find one way or another. So then as a painter, what's my job? Am I a decorator? Or am I trying to further our understanding of how we perceive ourselves in relationship to our surroundings using the tools which those that have come before me have laid out for me to take advantage of and my responsibility of trying to further that to the next infinitely small step? Next question. <laughs> Did anybody, I guess I should say, does anybody have any questions about that? <laughs> I would have never imagined that an artist would know all that. Well, it's part of what we do, yeah. right? I mean, what until 100 years ago, um, artists were categorized much closer to doctors and scientists than they were to creative frou-frous. Yeah. So you had to mix your own pigments, and you had to know how things work. If you don't know the chemistry, you can't do it, right? So part of the chemistry is how are people looking at what you're making? Um, and what are you trying to convey to them? And if you think that for a thousand years or more, that the great religions of the world were the patrons, yeah. that their message has to do with spirituality. So if you're now playing with, and in some cases, very, spe very specific Maybe spirituality, right? Okay. Was that the medieval century? Well, and, and many around it. I mean, the Renaissance, the Renaissance. And, and, and if you and don't just think um, Western-centrically, but think about the incredible arts that have come out of the East that are, that are being commissioned by caliphates, not that to use a word that we're throwing around in a, as something to, to abhor at the moment for all the obvious reasons. But for a thousand years, math was coming out of the Middle East. It wasn't coming out of France uh, and China and Japan. So all of those things... Are, are, are structures, uh, government structures, civil, civilization structures, which are based with a fixed point on top and everything else is beneath it. And, and one of the major influencers of that is the assorted religions of the world. And they are the ones in many cases that are going to the artists for the artist to then come and render depictions that will further the the viewer's understanding of God, one way or another. So, um, and in some cases, God is a reflection on yourself. In some cases, God is a reflection of something which is extremely monotheistic. In some cases, it's nature. I mean, there's all these different versions of what that is, but they're all of them, if you're the artist, you're trying to figure out what's the through line between them so that you can then play that, play that out. Yeah. If I have a job. Yeah. Nine to five. Mm. I have three kids, mm. and I'm a single mother. Why do I care? Well, you probably don't. Should, um, should I care? Maybe not. I mean, if these things are whether you care about them or not, that's part of the deal, right? We all have shit that we need to take care of. Um, and so sometimes I think more about this than others. Clearly, right? I mean, we all have things that are that are that are in our way of thinking um, beyond the day-to-day -day requirements that, that, that pull themselves, that, that pull us in their directions. Because those things are important. If you're a single mom and you have a nine to five job, at a minimum probably if you have three kids and you're trying to raise them, then probably the thing that you should care about is raising your kids and getting your job and not fuddling with this. But it doesn't mean that, she, that, that that's that that single mom is immune to the effects of them. It doesn't mean that that single mom, when she stands in front of St. George and the Dragon, isn't also going to see the sword and the head in the same place. 
Um, and it doesn't hurt, I don't think, anyone, regardless of how busy you are and all the manifestations of how things pull on you, to think about why are we here. We all come up with probably slightly different answers. Um, in some cases, we come up with very different answers. But that's why it's helpful, because if you're, for the single mom in this case, because if you're then trying to impart to your children, your number one job, right, is, is, is that you're taking care of your family, which is an impossible job. And in the context of that, one of the things that you want to try to do is instill your children with every opportunity that you can, using whatever tools that you have. And so a broad view of the universe is never a bad thing. What about the notion of uh, natural talent? Um, especially, I'm speaking in a visual arts yeah. standpoint right now. Natural talent versus um, a tremendous amount of investigation and study, which is the, uh, I would say, foundation of your work. Yeah. Um, what about one versus the other? Meaning, I went and I saw a painting, I liked it. It was cool. Versus uh, the soliloquy of math, <laughs> versus the images. <laughs> um, you know, I lost the, the specific. Talking Is about the exact question that you want? The, the idea of liking something or versus striving for it. talent that's what it was it was talent. talent my answer is always that talent is cheap um and that continues to be my answer talent's cheap there are lots of talented people in the world that use that as a crutch and therefore are always crippled what about people that look at your work and say well clearly you're talented i work hard for that to be the case and I, yeah, you get a little spark of it at the beginning, but the case of it's probably much more, I was not a project prodigy by any means. So the talent is the desire to do it. That's the talent. You can't obviously be completely inept, but you don't have to come out of the gate and be Rembrandt. I mean, it's, you know, there are certain things that I, it probably can't be taught, right? I mean, there's certain genetics has a way of playing things along, and I'll, I'll buy that. And I, I use it for somebody, you look at a little kid, I happen to have two of them, and um, if you throw a ball at a little kid, some little kids, man, they're not even thinking about it, they've got that ball. Now, does that make them a Hall of Fame third baseman? No. You take my other kid and you throw a ball at him and it hits him in the forehead and he falls over backwards. Now that's definitely not making him a <laughs> third baseman. So that's probably not where his interest will lie. Because it's difficult for him to want to pursue it. Unless he's like Teddy Roosevelt, right? I mean, there are some people who are just view themselves as so crippled that they it becomes their mission to overcome it. And that can be very powerful. But usually it's probably a, less that, that it's the talent is enough for you to be interested in it because you're good enough at it that it interests you and it's getting better as you go. I'm going to ask you about uh, the foundation you set up in 2012. Yeah. With um, so many issues in the world, uh, you know where I'm probably going with this, hunger, uh, homelessness, uh, violence, civil rights uh, yeah. issues of today, we just, terrorism, we just yeah. saw what happened in Paris. Um, why does it matter what happens to monkeys, elephants, and tigers in places that are so remote? Many of us, uh, as Americans specifically, would never get to see tigers or... Or whatever. Or yeah, whatever. all that stuff. Well, the answer that I... The answer that I came up with in my own mind, and so I'll relate it to you, is that all of the things that you discussed I view as symptoms of a deeper disease. So I view that our inability to communicate and our inability to 
relate to each other and our inability to respect each other's differences and similarities and hunger and education and 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 all ultimately has to do with an imbalance that we have come to both by our own and has been forced upon us where we have lost our balance and our connection to nature that we are spiraling off in something which is arguably out of control that the root cause of it is that we don't know who the hell we are or where we come from anymore. And I don't mean that I'm from New York City and that you're from New Orleans. I mean that we as human beings are animals that are part of a system that is collapsing. And if you put too many rabbits in a warren, they stop reproducing and they turn into cannibals. And there are too many people in our warren. Now what the hell you do about that, don't start. Because you cannot choose who should and who shouldn't. And I certainly don't even want to start barking up that tree. But it doesn't change the fact that it's true. So we have diminishing natural resources and more people that are eager for them. So to me, the reason that elephants and et cetera are important is because the base of who we are and where we come from has to do with an integrated natural system and part of that entails wilderness. That there still need be places on the world where the system works in order for the big system to work. And so as a result, if you want to save the world, you do it in very small ways. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the best thing is if you want to be the change that you hope to see in the world, or if you, if there was some, Gandhi was the guy who barked up this tree and had to do with the idea that you should be the change that you want to see in the world. And so for me, if wilderness is hugely important because it's symbolic of our relationship to a purely natural state, that uh, it's hugely important to try to save those last vestiges of wilderness. And then if you want to go about doing that, it's very difficult to go and say to people, hey, I really think we should go save this scrubland in northern Kenya. But it's a lot easier to say that there were 50,000 elephants killed last year for their tusks. And that it was the largest proportionate kill off in the history of the ivory trade. And if you think about that for a moment, the ivory trade is 10,000 years old. And last year was the worst year on record, and there have been some bad ones. And so if you cannot save the wild African elephant, something that we all, I think, universally love, even from a great distance, then what chance does any of it have? So that's why I narrowed it into that. It was something that I knew something about. It was a place that I knew something about. It was, people, it was a place where I knew people who, know, who knew much more about that than me, who I could go and approach and say, what can I do to help? Um, and then it was something which I could take to the larger world and try to get them interested in for the surface reason that we all love elephants, but for the undercurrent reason that we better figure out our relationship to our surroundings and quickly or else they are going to envelop us. And what better place in the world to know that than here? I'm going to ask you a few questions and then we're going to turn it over to our students. To Please. What is your favorite word? Ticonderoga. I wanted to name a kid Ticonderoga. My wife wouldn't let me, and then I wanted to name a dog Ticonderoga, and she wouldn't let me, and I just, it just rolls right on off the tongue. Ticonderoga. What is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Uh... I'm reading the, the unbroken book about Louis Zamperini that they just made the movie about. And this guy is staggering. I don't know if you all saw the movie. I haven't seen it. But if it's anything like the book. I read the book. Unreal. Unbelievable. So this guy has a, not just a joie de vivre, but a force of will in circumstances that are so much more difficult than I could ever face. And he comes, he doesn't exactly come through all of it smiling, but he comes through all of it finding 
the, um, the inner fortitude and the spiritual ease, ease is the wrong word, and the spiritual recognition of the beauty of the surrounding world in the face of real hardship, that that kind of example I find inspired creatively, spiritually, and otherwise. Because it says to me that I can be better. And therefore, go be so. What turns you off? <laughs> um, money. Money's a drag. I, I know that it's something that we all need. I know that it's something that, um, that makes the world go round. Uh, and I'm not going to debate whether that's a good thing or not in the larger sense of things, but God, not having it is a real fucking bummer. And I think that that's something that we all can understand, right? I mean, in all, no matter how much money you have, I saw this guy who I was fussing about this with some a long time ago, and he has serious coin, this dude. I mean, he's got houses and houses and boats and planes, and his answer was that it's all the same story. His bills are bigger but they still come, right? And so I think it's one of those things where we forget the forest through the trees in that, that it's a universal thing which gives us all serious heartburn and keeps us awake at night and is ultimately stifling. Uh, so that, but I'm not ready to come up with what a new system should be because it's nice when you've got it too. What is your, <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Ticonderoga. <laughs> My favorite curse word, um, I guess it's Ungawa, which sort of loosely translates into fucking A. Ungawa! You can get away with it. I can get away with it with my wife in front of my five year old, so. What sound and noise do you love? What sound or noise or do noise. you love? Oh, wow. Well. It's a combination of noises. Um, and it's, yeah. if you've ever slept out, and it's, this is a universal thing, if you've ever slept out by a river, mm. not in a tent, but on the ground, mosquito net, if there are mosquitoes, if not, not, and you listen to the river, and you listen to the things that are awake at night, and you don't know what they are. And they have a certain, you know, you're musical, so you have, they, they have a certain orchestral nature to them. Where out of the blue, you'll hear something that wasn't there before, and then it will diminish and it will start to play off of something else. And often you'll get a call from here that's responding and back and forth. And it creates an entire universe which you otherwise miss if you're not sleeping by the river. So it's a combination of those things. And the other thing is called the dawn chorus. And it's particularly evident in places, well, I've, I hear it often in Africa, but you find it in other places too. You probably find it here, frankly. Um, and it's right before the sun comes up, when you get the first little bit of light. You know, the, the opposite of it in terms of the day, time of day would be the gloaming, right? It's after the sun has gone down, before it's dark, that, that purple, gray, fuzzy light. If you do that at dawn, Sun's not up yet, but you're getting the first hint that the night is over and the morning is coming. The dawn chorus is successive layers of bird calls on top of each other that come to a head when the sun actually busts over the horizon. And then by the time the full ball is above the horizon line, is over. And it's the world waking up. I, I like that one too. So the sleeping by the river and the listening to the dawn chorus. Beats the hell out of jackhammers and subways. What sound or noise do you hate? Jackhammers, subways. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? You know, I keep trying new ones uh, anyway. So I don't know that my profession is, 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 is tied down into a singular thing. So I own my own business, so it means I get to do a little accounting. And I own, I got to do contracts, so I get to do a little lawyering. And I, you know, have a house, so I get to do a little carpentry. I get to do lots of things. If any of, if, if, if changing my profession meant stopping all of the things that I'm already doing, then none of them are eligible. If it's something that I could add on top of it, 
I hate to fly. I mean, it really scares me. So I'd like to be a pilot. <laughs> because then it wouldn't scare me anymore. Uh, <laughs> I went heli skiing like two weeks ago. And, you know, when you get on the helicopter and they drop you off at the top of the world and you ski down. I have to say, no, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, I did that two weeks ago. And, and uh, the skiing part's great. The helicopter part, God. F very frightening. <laughs> so I'd like something that made me not quite so afraid of, about that stuff. What profession would you like not to do? Oh, pilot. <laughs> <laughs> if, heaven, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome. All together in one fell swoop. Uh, you know, I don't expect that. So um, it's not that I expect to go to hell, because I don't expect that either. I don't expect it to, that kind of duality to exist. I think that there is much more longevity to life. So what I would truly like is that when I go through the door to whatever the next step is, the thing that we all of us do, regardless of what you believe, that there is a next thing that is in some means connected to the great universality of life. And then that's enough, because that means that I'm part of this larger system and continue to be. Questions for Alex Beard. Ma'am. Going back to your foundation. Yeah. The reason you started it is about basically saving nature and animals in the universal sense of the word, mankind. That makes it sound pretty lofty, but, that's, but something like that. Immediately what I thought of was, well, my instant, instantaneous thought was, should you have started with the animals or the desert deserting of the world? They're all the same. It's all the same conversation. But how, since the, the law... So, okay, so the actual, the actual log line, if you will, the actual um, three-sentence description of what my foundation does is the, the Watering Hole Foundation is dedicated to protect endangered species and the environments in which they live by engaging with community-based conservation groups around the world to identify needs and provide for them. So what that means is the environments in which they live, that has to do with the desert desertification. And why are things, why is the Sahara Desert going south? Well, because you're disrupting the natural balance of the way that the elephants knock down certain trees and those trees create holes in the forest and those holes in the forest become places where the antelope come and blah, 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 right? So all of those, it's just a means in. It's how do you get into the conversation? And I picked the way that I did it um, largely because I was the most interested in the community-based part of it. As in, if I go to various parts of the world and I tell people how to save themselves, not only is that presumptuous, but it's probably not useful or helpful. But if I go and I say, what can I help you with? What is it that you're doing that, that you need some assistance with? Um, then that tends to work better. Um, and then it's holistic. No, the I'm not at the moment. Uh, and no is the short answer. I'm not. But I'm not not. I mean, I, I'm not intentionally not right. doing something right. in China. I mean, the, 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 the only thing that I'm immediately doing that has anything to do with China is trying to spread the world word about rhino horn and ivory and like that. And then I'm a little adversarial when it comes to the Chinese and the environment as it happens. It's kind of frightening. Um, and this is a subject probably for a, an offline different day, but um, there is a real live hot and cold war playing out all over the third world right now over natural resources between the West, the indigenous populations, and China. And China's winning by a lot. And they are raping <coughs> the shit out of the planet. Yeah. Um, so maybe it should have more to do with China. Next question. Um, you talk about China. We have major issues right here. I'm an avid outdoorsman. No doubt. Grew up fishing. I could, you know, I'm going to go in my boat this Monday and go fishing. And areas where I used to have to go in bayous or canals, as you refer yeah, to them, 
they're gone. Yeah. That's exactly. why you can see from where I fish, the city of New Orleans, like the, the lakes are right on top of it. Yeah. And nobody seems to do anything. It just, uh, well, it just, they try different diversions and the state gets sued and this and that. And I was wondering, what do you think we could do to make, take care of that issue better? So that's, a, that's an interesting one. Because, of course, you're absolutely 100% correct. And it's a conversation that I've been having of late, and when I say of late, over the course of the last year or so, with people who are actively engaged in individual projects around the coastline in the state, trying to reverse coastal erosion. Um, so the nature of the way that I think about what I personally can do has to do with small projects that others can use to expand upon. So I've been looking for a means by which, for example, I'm going to use the Africa example to bring it back specifically to here. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to deflect. So in northern Kenya, I just finished financing a security and observation outpost to man it with people with guns to monitor the elephant gap going from one part of northern Kenya to another, because that's a point where they're being punched. Now, I'm not in a position to build the entire infrastructure to stop poaching in northern Kenya. But I can take that little piece of it and implement it so that the infrastructure that exists already has more of a foothold to be effective. OK? Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So I've now, specifically here in relationship to the coast, been looking for examples where I could do something, or I could go raise $50,000 for a thing that then an existing infrastructure can utilize. If you think about it this way, if you've got a budget of a million bucks and you spend a million dollars, you have no money at the end of the year. And often there is a small tipping point project where if you put that in place, the million bucks that were spent can now really multiply because the infrastructure exists in order to take advantage of the individual small gift or whatever it is, however you want to say it, that I as an individual can do. So I've been looking for how do you figure out what that is? And is that a boat? Is that a salary? Is that a, is that a couple of, you know, 100 yards of bag ass? I don't know what it is. Um, now, collectively, what can we do about it? There's, I got some thoughts about that. And it has to do with why are we the third or fourth busiest port in the world exporting tremendous amounts of food and resources to the rest of the world and taking their oil in here to, to, to run our consumptive and cooking economy. And we're broke. We don't have any police in the French Quarter. Right? I mean, how is it that the state has given away the baby with the bathwater? And that maybe we should figure out some way to keep some of that money that's going everywhere else here for the coast. Now, I'm not the only person that thinks that, clearly, and it's not my idea either. But that strikes me as a hell of a lot of our good sense. Uh, I know that Mary Landry was involved in that in the Senate. Let's hope that um, this new guy is too. Um, I think that we have been abandoned a little bit by our leaders for personal purpose. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, apply that to whomever you choose, yeah. and all of the above. Next question. Yeah, that's a tough one to follow up on, yeah. <laughs> um, so earlier you brought up um, how art, math, and religion are all kind of interconnected. Mm. And back about 300 BC, Pythagoras actually said that um, reality is based off of numbers, and then he found there is a human soul, but the musical or the mathematical connection between them is music and art, things your soul can harmonize mm. with. Do you believe that is true? Some version of that. Some version of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I believe is that I don't know. Right? And but that I feel like Pythagoras is probably closer than extremist Islam or the Spanish Inquisition, right? I mean, I, so that's, I do, I think that, the, yes, I think that there's something in that. I think that the interconnectedness of the universe and how we interact with it and ourselves and each other has common bonds which language cannot yet articulate exactly what that is. Math is a means by doing it. Music is a means by doing it. Painting is a means by doing it. There are certain things which universally touch our souls, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but I don't know what it is. Right? I don't pretend to. And, and 
I, as soon as I'm sure, then I know I'm wrong. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. You're obviously spiritual. Are there certain religions that you not well subscribe to or just pull things from? Yeah, I pull a little bit from a lot. The one thing that I pull most from organized religion are things to avoid. And, and it really boils down to a very, very simple thing. Ex exclusivity is a bad thing. So if your religion suggests an inclusive message, then I'm an acolyte of your religion. Because I think ultimately they're all figuring out means of talking about exactly the same thing to their own audience. And as soon as that says that our audience is right and your audience is wrong, then there's a problem. Up to that, we should all be working on this stuff together. And, and then, um, who am I to criticize someone else's beliefs? Right, so I try to stay away from that. But there are certain things that resonate to me through ritual, upbringing, and comfort that I take from different places. I am as likely to say Um Namah Shivaya as I am the Lord's Prayer and do both in different contexts. <laughs> uh, the Lord's Prayer usually before I fly and Um Namah Shivaya before I open my bills. <laughs> last question. Um, in the last couple of years, as far as uh, me keeping up with <clears throat> news and the times and stuff, ever since, especially since the new civil rights things have become uh, evident and have become in popular uh, media and everything, uh, there seems to be a more, like, a, like I, I think people are getting more in touch with the situation at hand, and also, as a result, also other things like the environment and things are also coming out of that. Uh, one, would you agree with that? And two, in the last few years of a lot of this coming out and people trying to take a bigger uh, stand towards it, yes, there's a lot left to do, obviously, but have you noticed in your travels or anything or in any context any uh, progress towards getting slightly back to where we should be? Yeah. Yes. Um, and no. Right? Both. Um, there are, uh, when I was born, um, when we were born, we probably were not sitting next to each other in public mm -hmm. in certain parts of the country. That's not true now. Good. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of slaves, real, full-blown, fucking A, hardcore slaves, building soccer stadiums in Qatar. Right. Progress and the opposite. I think that as far as the civil rights questions um, that have been addressed over the course of the last six months in particular, with yeah. the this summer and then and then the video of the guy in New York. Um, I think that again, that that it's not just about itself. Um, and in the case of those, I think that that has to do with a larger sense of governing and policing. Right. So, and, that, and let me explain what I mean by that, which is that there is there is a, there was a conscious decision made, which we allowed to be made that fear would be a part of our staple diet. And that a means by which that, that the nourishment that the fear was providing would allow us to do things like say that it was okay to have a broken window policy to clean up New York, which was effective, but also really not. So that's a micro, but it's also on a macro. You know, th th there is a sense that fear is a great tool for control. And part of that is that if you're afraid in general, it's easy for me to tell you what to do to make you safe. Oh, vote for me, I'll keep you safe. Or uh, don't go there, 
Go here because you'll be safer. Or don't trust the black guy, he's dangerous. So it's okay for me without any provocation to put him up against a wall and check his pockets because sometimes they have a gun. I mean, that's where that comes from. And it's a policy. So the fact that it then manifests itself, it's a little bit, I don't view it that much differently, actually, than going from slavery to Jim Crow. And from Jim Crow to whatever it was sort of between Jim Crow and the beginning of, of really an active, successful civil rights motion, mo movement. And then an active civil rights movement to where we now are. They're different versions with different extremities, clearly, because obviously slavery and what's going on in the inner cities is related but not the same. Um, so you can't call them apples to apples because they aren't, but they do have to do with the larger sense that we're being fed fear by the powers that be to allow them to get away with murder, sometimes literally. And that comes back to me with we have a lost balance with ourselves in relationship to our surroundings. In order for us to be frightened enough to let them do it, it means we're not confident enough with who we are and the environment in which we live. So it all roots back to the same. It's it manifests like itself in a million ways. What? It's always been like that. Yeah, and it's always been, but it doesn't make it excusable. Christianity. Yeah, it doesn't make it excusable, but I view that that's the condition that we're facing, really. I mean, that's what this is about. Some of it has to do, and I think that's enough, because, you know, we could talk about that for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and years and years and years and years. And personal experience, not just mine, but everybody's personal experience, starts to make it very difficult to think about those things in the abstract, for all the right reasons. Let's thank our guest, Alex Beard.